Uh, thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we grew Branch and how we started to scale internationally and how we built products that scale for billions of users that are now using our links. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Mada. I started first, so before Branch, I actually built an app. It was a mobile app called Kindred. It was a photo book printing app. And I'll tell you a little bit about the story of that and how we failed. And then, we st and then I started Branch uh, in June of 2014. So that was less than four years ago. Um, and today, we grew to have over 30,000 apps around the world using us. We're about 160 people in seven different offices around the world. Um, and we raised over 100 million, which is not a good thing. It's better to make your own money than raise it. So, uh, And these are some of the brands using us. You probably recognize some of them, like Airbnb and Pinterest and Tinder and Slack and, and many others. Um, and we are the linking infrastructure for these brands. So we help them create a seamless experience on mobile to great links. So I'm going to go through four different lessons that I hope apply to those of you in the audience who are thinking of starting companies, who are in the early stages, who are thinking of building companies that will eventually go global. So lesson number one, and this is you know, whenever I go and I talk to founders, as startup entrepreneurs, I'm asked, you know, what's the one lesson you would give? And this is number one, my lesson that I give all the time. It's basically don't become too attached to an idea, either a company or a product. As founders, we fall in love with our ideas. We need to do that to be able to propel them against all odds, right? We go and we start something and uh, the world tells us, no, you can't do that. And it's so hard to start something new. So we become really attached to our ideas. And I, you know, we failed three times, and I was very attached to each of them. So I'll tell you a story, uh, the to story of Kindred, our photo book printing app that almost made it. We were almost famous. Um, so you know, you start with an idea. And for us, we sat in a room. I remember we were in business school at Stanford. And we were in a room, and we're like, man, we're going to find the best idea ever. And we stayed in this room, and we're thinking about everything. And we had this big, big sheet, big, big board, and we're like, what are the pros and cons, and what's going to make it really big? And we're like, well, how about photo books? You know, we take photos on our phones, and our parents and grandparents really like to get printed stuff. So what if we build an app that bridged that? So that's how Kindred was born. We had this great idea. And we said we were going to be a rocket ship. The printing market is enormous. And we are going to go international. And, and it was going to be great. So these are some of the ads that I designed. I did marketing then as well. So these are our photo books. This is how they looked. And we had an Android and an iPhone app. Uh, and these were the books. And they only cost $5. So you know, after four months of development, we were like, we have this idea. We're going to launch it, and it's going to be great. And we launched it, and we got 10 installs. And we're like, man, I, we thought we were going to be famous. But then something happened. Actually, both Android and Apple featured us in Best New Apps. And this was Android featuring on the Best Apps of 2013. And you know, they changed everything. We were a rocket ship. <laughs> uh, we woke up one morning, and we didn't know that, that we were going to be featured. So we woke up, and we're like, oh my god, thousands of downloads overnight. What is happening? And you know, it was amazing. We really felt that we were on top of the world, and being an entrepreneur was amazing, and we were going to take over the world with photo books. And then the features ended. <laughs> And we stopped getting installs. I mean, Apple still featured us in like some like list they had, but we were no longer in best new apps. And if any of you have had your app featured, you know that being on the front page of the App Store is very different than not being on the front page of the App Store. So this was, you know, the trough of despair. What do we do with our lives? Uh, so then we had these investors that came and said. We'll give you fifty thousand dollars, and you can, you know, buy installs, and just in time for Christmas. 
This was Christmas of 2013. And we're like, yeah, let's do it. So I learned how to buy install ads, and I spent all the $50,000 on buying a shit ton of installs. They were cheaper then than they are now. And we were like, we were, we were killing it. People were buying photo books, and we had this idea that these people are going to buy photo books once, and they were going to love it so much that they were going to come, keep coming back, and it was going to be a, a subscription business. And it really wasn't. So we ran all our numbers, and we really were ROI negative if we continued to buy uh, and spend so much money on advertising. So we, we said, OK, let's try to do something viral. But we, never, we were never able to quite figure it out. And we ended up slowly dying. This was us dying. Uh, we know we kept it going for a long time, pretty much right before we started Branch. And we tried everything. We were never, we were never able to like, really make it big. And the idea is that in the very early days, like we really became very attached. We had we sold 15,000 books, which is a lot. We made we made we made like real money, and it's hard to say you know we were a failure. We should try to do something else because you see people using it and they love your product, but it wasn't really a product market fit, and we didn't have enough people doing it. So we had to try something else, and you know the idea of branch came from from our problem. So we felt our choices were limited. Either we were going to go after the app stores or we were going to buy installs. And we didn't feel we had anything else that we could do. So we tried and tried. And when we started Branch, we really like, got into a room and we said, OK, what was our biggest problem? What, what was the one thing that we struggled with so much? And it, it became this like linking and mobile growth and being able to grow the app. And that's how we started Branch out of like a real problem. While, while Kindred was very much, we sat in a room and brainstormed. So you know, we realized it was an industry problem. And it's actually very hard. Like the, there's something called the power law. Uh, fortune uh, favors already discovered in the app stores. They're, they have the money. They're getting revenue. So they can invest more money. And they can get more people in. While you know an independent app and someone trying to start from the very beginning has a very very hard time starting over, and we built we started Branch to change this and really help apps kind of um, be able to do viral programs and sharing and things that like actually help them grow. So lesson number one: if you have something that's kind of working but not really. Be OK giving it up and try to start something else. If we had continued doing Kendra, we would have never been where we are today. We would have probably still been four founders in a garage. Um, and the ability to actually let go of something and try something better uh, what was really what made us successful. The second lesson, <laughs> find the changing wave and ride it. So I heard someone talk about how the biggest companies are made when there's a big platform shift. So when something changes, the old incumbent companies, because they're so big, they have a really hard time adapting to the new platform, to the new change. And that's when a startup can come in and actually grow and take over. And you can see this with Bitcoin. We can see this with a lot of changing trends and how large companies, even Google and Facebook, are having sometimes a hard time adapting. And the newer companies can kind of come in and, and take over. And that's where, like for us, that like big, big wave was mobile. Um, and you know, it slowly became the dominant platform. But unfortunately, what, what actually ended up happening, it wasn't a unified platform. So the large companies started understanding that this is a platform that they should follow. If you look at places like Starbucks, they really uh, started understanding that by give, allowing people to order online, it, can really, it really boosted the sales in the US. And I think it's like something like 40% of all their orders come on mobile in the US. People just, instead of going and staying in line, they order in advance. Uh, and they're doing really interesting things. Like if, if what you can see here is like they're doing Instagram ads. And they're using those ads to actually re-engage and bring people into the app and get them to actually order the thing that there was in the Instagram ad. McDonald's doing the same thing. You know, the McDonald's app here in Japan is really just a coupon app, but they're trying to change that. And they're adding a mobile ordering app uh, that will give faster service on, on, on the menu with mobile orders. Uh, the problem with mobile is it, it's what happened was it, 
on desktop, everything was simple. You know, you have you had the HTTP protocol that brought everything together, and all the websites were the same. But on on you know on mobile, things are different. You have all these different OSs, and they all behave differently. And we have a lot of different types of hardware and devices. And you have app and web, uh, and they don't really intermingle, and they have they they behave differently. And then you have different platforms that are actually trying to own the users. You have like Facebook and Google and WeChat and Snapchat. And all of these large platforms are actually trying to keep the user in. Uh, so, so when you think about the experience on mobile, it could be you know, someone on the Facebook browser or on iOS. And they, get a they might be getting a very different experience clicking on a link, for example, as someone on Android or on one specific type of device who's like on a different browser. So we basically realized that this was you know, the wave, and that was a change, and there was a real need in the, in the market, in the mobile market for unification. So we came in with these links that work no matter where you click on it, right? If you click on it on desktop, on a, uh, if you have a app, if you don't have a app, if, if you click on any type of device, we always take people to the content. And that was kind of the big need and the big shift that we saw in the market, and that's what really helped us grow really fast. Uh, and I think my challenge to you, when you try to build your own company, is to think, like, what is the shift in your market? What is the one thing that's changing that you can actually take advantage of and, 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 and kind of ride that wave to build your own startup? This is just an example of Airbnb using our links. And there's a lot of different people at the company using it because you have to use the links in all the different platforms to be able to unify um, all the different channels together across web, app, and all the different platforms. Uh, the other, the other, you know, the fourth lesson is to follow your customer needs and adapt. So, if you heard about our story in the very early days, we started with with the problem that you couldn't pass parameters through install on the app store. So you didn't know where someone was coming from when they opened an app for the first time, and our links basically solve that, and you call that the for deep linking. And it was a great, right? But that was our, our need. We were a tiny app building something for the first time. And then when we started to understand how larger companies like uh, Pinterest or Airbnb are using uh, and then doing marketing, it was very different. They had emails, and they sent, you know, Sephora uses us to send billions of emails. And they were very different. You know, we never thought that deep linked email was a thing because we were a tiny startup and we didn't ever send email to our customers. But as we started learning about the market, we understood that we were we had to adapt. We had to adapt what to uh, what other customers needed from our solution. And we while initially we built, you know, we built branch for us as startup entrepreneurs, uh, building an app, we had to adapt and build it for like large enterprises that needed some things that were very different. So I guess the lesson would be, in the early days, you might have a need and start a company that solves your problem. But as you grow, you need to like adapt and be in the market and really understand what other much larger customers need. And the fourth lesson, and the last one, uh, and this is you know when people ask for one advice uh, to give to entrepreneurs, I always say, keep building. Because I think it's just something that, you know, before Kindred, we actually tried uh, a different company called, it was a Fitbit for dogs. So we, we really failed three times before Branch. It was the same team, so we're the same founders. We were worked for like almost a year and a half before starting Branch. And we kept failing, and we're like, well, we just kept trying to build something new. And, and even the idea at Branch started because we built something that didn't work and we needed something and we saw this need in the market. So, so you know, the advice would be, even if you don't know where to start, just start somewhere. It doesn't have to be the ultimate idea. Trying to build something, you might learn something new that will help you build you know, the next big business. I think this was the idea Slack. Slack's founding story is probably very similar to ours. They were trying to do a gaming company. And then they realized that they needed a better way to communicate with each other, and that's how Slack was born. So as long as you keep building, you'll keep learning, and you'll keep adapting, and you'll be able to actually start something important. Uh, for us, I'll give you an example of a way that we <laughs> kept building a branch. Uh, this, is, this is my co-founders in the very early days when we moved into our first office from an incubator. and. Uh, you know, I still look at that office. We didn't have a board yet, and we had 
stuff everywhere. But we were always like working and building. And in, the, in those days when we were just, I think we we're six people total, we had two employees. I decided that I wanted to build a community and I wanted to build events and I want to start doing marketing. So uh, I was like, okay, what is one thing I could bring, bring people together and learn from them? And it was like our big need was mobile growth, so let's build something around mobile growth. So we decided to create a meetup. <laughs> So we, I put it on meetup.com, and I went and called, I think, like seven different pizza places. And one of them had half off on that day. So we ordered a half off pizza, and we went and bought our own beer. And this was our first meetup. In the, and, and the incubator we were in gave us free space. So we did our first meetup. And uh, you know we realized that people were interested in our product. And you know we could bring people in, talk about mobile growth, but we could also tell them about branch. And we decided to scale it and kept building it. And I ended up hiring someone. And then we ended up doing hundreds of meetups. Uh, and we have like now, if you go to events.branch.io, is this awesome you know, page with all our different mobile growth events. And these are all the places where we did meetups. So we started small, and we tested, and we iterated. And then we actually kept growing and growing. And we got to like 26,000 members. And it was just something that, you know, we started small. It, it didn't take that long to call the pizza places and get some people in. But we learned from it uh, and just kept building. So I think, when, you know, when someone tells you, oh, you can go and build a community, uh, it might sound daunting. But everything is like one step. You just start really small. You start with like a local event and then you do another one and another one. And then maybe you had money and you hire someone else. So don't, you know, when, you, when I remember going to a, someone else's site, I think it was Meteor, and they had something like that, and I was like, oh my god, I'm never going to be able to create a community that big. Look at those guys. And that was three years ago, and now we have the community. So don't, don't, don't be scared <laughs> of, 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 you know, what the future could bring. Right? You can do it. You just have to do it one step at a time. And this was, you know, the events that we did last year. So we started so small, and then we ended up doing our own conference, uh, and did like 77 meetups and like 21 dinners, and it just, you can do it. You just start with one, and then another one, and then another one, and you, you just, it's, everything is actually possible um, if you just start small, and then you just go one at a time, and you just keep trying and keep building. And you can do, things might not work. You know, we tried doing lunch and learns, and realized that they don't work, and we cut them completely. We tried sponsoring big events, didn't work for us, stop doing that. So just test and keep building. And don't be scared uh, if you fail. It's OK to fail. Don't get too attached to your ideas. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to, I think, be in a Q&A if you have any questions and I can help in any way. I'm mad at Thank you so much.